I invite you to remain standing as today we read from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, part of the Sermon on the Mount. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ for each one of us. Let us hear these holy words. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these words, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This is the word of God for the people of God. We once again say a word of greeting this morning to all of you. We once again emphasize that it is Father's Day and we honor fathers and father figures, those who have been impactful in your life in some way by being dedicated to you and serving you. We hope that today is a very special day for all fathers. It is an opportunity for you to show your love to them. We hope you'll take advantage of that great opportunity. We want to say a word of welcome this morning to those in Hamburg and Hampton and Center Ridge, as well as those who are in our respective hospitals across the state of Arkansas, our homebound, and also those in our respective nursing homes. We're thankful to have all of you as a part of our service of worship today. It is a joy for you to be here. I say that because usually on Father's Day, the attendance is abysmal. Mother's Day is like Easter. We got to set up chairs, people all over the place. And I've tried to figure out over the years why that's the case. I think I figured it out. For moms, we always say, hey, mom, what do you want to do on Mother's Day? I want the whole family to get together and I want everybody to sit with me at church. Hey, dad, what do you want to do for Father's Day? Bring me breakfast in bed. That's what I want. But we're glad you're here despite the rain you're here and we're grateful to have your presence with us today we again are grateful for those who are watching on television and online also it is a joy to be able to celebrate our faith together let us pray O oh lord in the silence of this moment prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives amen when I was in seminary, I worked in two different churches as a youth director. I enjoyed my time working with teenagers, but I eventually realized that wasn't finally my calling. I had a really good relationship with many of those kids that lasted for years and years. So often as the years went by, I was asked to officiate their weddings, and it was such a joy to be able to do that, seeing them grow up and become mature along the way. In one particular church, I had a brother and sister. They were wonderful. She was a very attractive young lady, wildly popular. He was a good looking young man, but he was very much a loner. These two became very important in my life and I became very important in their life. But eventually, as is often the case, I would leave that church and go on and serve other churches and go on with life just as they went on with life. About 10 years passed and one day I received a call from this young man. I'm not gonna name him. And he said, listen, I'm in prison and I have a chance to make a call. I just wanna talk to you. He said, I've had a life of drugs and alcohol and I have committed a lot of crimes, trying to feed my habit. I've lost everything. Would you be willing to correspond with me? I said, of course I would. So for the next several months, I wrote him letters, sent him a Bible, devotional books. We corresponded back and forth. I really felt sorry for him. He had lost his wife as a result of his problems, and his child. He was low. Once again, he was in prison and he wrote me a letter. It was the final letter I would ever receive from him. 
He said, John, I was told my whole life about Jesus Christ, and I failed to act on those words. And as a result, my life has come crumbling down. I have lost everything and everyone. And then he quoted this passage of Scripture. Less than a month later, because he had abused his body so much, he died. He was not yet 30 years of age. I always remember that letter, and I kept it for lots of years. Somewhere along the way, I've lost it. But I remember how pointedly he said, I heard the words of Jesus, and I failed to act on them. Jesus, in this portion of Scripture, is reciting what we call the Sermon on the Mount, a collection of teachings and sayings. And Jesus says that there are two kinds of people in relationship with him. There are the kind of individuals who hear his words and act on them. They are the ones who are wise. Then there are those kinds of people who hear his words and refuse to act on them, and they are foolish. He tells a parable. There is a man who is wise because he builds his house on rock. When the storms come and the winds blow, his house remains intact because he has a rock-solid foundation. But there is also a man who is foolish, says Jesus, because he builds his house on sand. It is not rock solid. It is constantly shifting. And when the storms come and the winds blow, his house collapses and great is its fall, says Jesus. What Jesus means by that, of course, is that we have a responsibility to put our hope and our trust and our faith in someone or something. All of us do that. Jesus says, you are wise if you put your hope and your faith and your trust in me. You will have a rock-solid foundation. But if you choose not to act on the words that I have offered to you, you will have created for yourself another foundation, and it will be shifting sand. It is rock or it is sand for all of us. On what have you built your life? Is it a foundation built on a relationship with Jesus Christ? Or is it someone or something else? After Jesus teaches this parable, interestingly enough, the scripture says that people are astounded by his teaching because he has taught not like the scribes. Now, what does that mean? In ancient times, in Jesus' day, when scribes taught, basically what they did is regurgitate what previous rabbis had said. They simply quoted from rabbis gone by. But Jesus doesn't quote from someone else. Jesus and his words originate with him. And people are astounded at his wisdom and his insight, his knowledge. He's not like the scribes just quoting somebody else. This comes directly from him. Rock or sand, says Jesus, either act on my words or you don't. But your foundation is built on something or someone. Is it solid or is it constantly shifting? You know, the Bible is filled with examples, particularly in the New Testament, of people who have either a rock-solid foundation or one that is constantly shifting. Peter, for example, had both. You will recall that when Jesus is to be crucified, he is taken before the authorities, and there are those who see Peter off in the distance as Peter watches to find out what's going to happen to Jesus. And they say, aren't you the guy that hung out with Jesus? And three times Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. His foundation is not built on Jesus Christ. 
It is built on himself at that point. And as a result, there are shifting sands and he betrays Jesus. Great is Peter's fall. But after Jesus is resurrected and Peter encounters the resurrected Lord, there is a time when Peter and John will stand before the Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish Supreme Court, and the Sanhedrin say to Peter and John, stop talking about this resurrected Christ. Quit talking about him. Your life is at stake if you continue to do it. And Peter stands before them boldly and proudly and says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which one can be saved. We will not stop preaching. Peter goes from being a coward to risking his life and eventually dying for the faith. His foundation had become rock solid in Jesus Christ because he had encountered the resurrected Lord. He was willing to be courageous and strong. He acted on the words of Jesus. There is a woman with a flow of blood. She is unclean. For 12 years, she is not to be touched because if one touches her, she or he becomes unclean. Anything she sits on or lies on is unclean. She has been ostracized and she has been alienated, but she desperately wants to be made well. And she comes into a crowd of people and risks her life in the process of doing so because if she goes into a crowd of people, she taints those who will touch her. And eventually, as a result of doing that without any regard for the law, she could have been killed. But she is so bent on coming into the presence of Jesus because she knows who Jesus is. She knows what he's capable of doing, making her well, and she will stop at nothing. And she touches the hem of his garment and she is made well. It is the one time in scripture where Jesus heals somebody and he doesn't even know it. He says, did somebody touch me? Power has left me. And then Jesus does not condemn her. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. She had a rock solid foundation in Jesus Christ, despite her condition. She knew that if she could just come into his presence, he was gonna do something to alter her life for the better, to change her, to make her whole all over again. She had that rock solid foundation. There is a woman who comes into the presence of Jesus as people are around and she kneels at his feet and she anoints his feet with a costly perfume. She takes the tears from her eyes that have fallen on his feet and with her own hair, she washes the feet of Jesus. And the sanctimonious self-righteous disciples who don't seem to get who Jesus is, look at her and say, oh, she should have given that sold that costly perfume, given the money to the poor. And Jesus said, you don't get it, do you? I'm not gonna be here much longer. She's anointing my body. She is the one who gets it. She is the one who understands what I'm gonna go through. You guys don't get it, she does. She had a rock solid foundation. It was her way of expressing extraordinary love to Jesus when the others simply did not understand. She knew who Jesus was when those who should know who he was, didn't. That's what happens sometimes in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We know who he is, or we don't. But one way or another, you will notice in this parable that Jesus tells, both the one who is on a rock solid foundation and the one who is on shifting sand face the storms of life. Being in a rock solid relationship with Jesus Christ does not mean that we are immune to pain and suffering and difficulty. On the contrary, this parable tells us that everybody faces the storm. The question is, what do we do when we face the storm? Do we have a solid foundation or is it going to be shifting sand and our world is gonna collapse in on ourselves? When I was a young man in my mid-twenties, my dad's church caught on fire. They were adding on to the church. A welder's torch caught the roof of the church on fire and the beautiful historic sanctuary burned to the ground. Shortly after that, 
My parents' house burned to the ground. A faulty lamp caught the house on fire as they slept in the night, and the whole house was destroyed. Just a matter of months after that, my mother died of cancer. And then shortly after that, my dad's secretary, to whom he was very close, he discovered had been embezzling a staggering amount of money from the church, and he had to have her arrested. It was traumatic. In a less than two-year period, the church burned down, the house burned down, my mother died, he had to have a dear friend arrested. It was overwhelming for him. And I remember asking him, Dad, how are you doing with all this? And he said, I have Jesus. I'm going to be okay. But I don't know how people who don't have Jesus can make it. See, that's a rock-solid foundation. There is never a promise in Scripture that if you're faithful, you're not going to have to deal with difficulties in life. On the contrary, it says when we go through difficulties in life, we have a choice. We either act on the words of Jesus and we follow his teachings and we try to live as a faithful disciple of his and we have hope and trust and faith in him to somehow get through all of this or we don't. And if we have hope and trust in ourselves or someone or something else, it is shifting sand and our world will eventually collapse. Paul says we boast in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance and per perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us. Now, how Paul, can Paul say that when he has been brutalized for his relationship with Jesus Christ, imprisoned over and over again, stoned, whipped, repeatedly, because Paul had a rock-solid relationship with our Lord. There was no shifting sand for him. He knew where he stood. He knew how to live in such a way that his foundation beneath him was always what it should be. And that's important for all of us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. This week, as I was working on this sermon, the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa came to mind like it has for many of us, and so I looked up information about that. When the Leaning Tower of Pisa was built, of course it was not supposed to lean, but it was built on clay and shell and sand. And immediately it began to lean, and the only reason it hasn't fallen over is because there are counterweights attached to it now to keep it from falling. The foundation was not rock solid. And we can go across the world now and see buildings that are hundreds of stories high that reach up into the clouds. And they're firmly implanted where they are because they're built with a foundation that rests on bedrock. They're not going anywhere. There really is something about foundations that make a determination about the stability of some structure, and that's true with our lives. Years ago, Susan and I moved to Fort Worth. I was appointed by the bishop to serve a church I didn't want to serve. We used to drive by it regularly. I told Susan, that's the last church I ever want to serve. Well, guess what? It was my very next church. <laughs> As we were going to tour the parsonage before we arrived, they said to us, we want to apologize ahead of time for the parsonage. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, that is not a good sign. <laughs> it was disgusting. It was gross. It was nasty. But here's the major problem. We moved into the house. The foundation was cracked all over the place. As a result, there were cracks in every single room of the house, multiple cracks. You could put your finger in them. They were that big. We had major plumbing problems because the foundation had shifted all the piping. We had someone come over our first winter to clean the fireplace, and he said, I can't clean this fireplace. I said, why not? He said, because it's about to fall on top of me. 
I went to the church and said, we can't live in this. And they said, you're right, but we don't have any money. I said, well, I don't care. You're going to have to find some money somewhere. We're not going to live in this house anymore. It's going to fall in on us and kill us. They came and inspected it and said, you can't live in it anymore. It's too dangerous. And we moved out. See, when the foundation shifts and it is not solid, it creates all kinds of other problems. We have a choice, says Jesus. It's simple. You either hear the words I have to share with you, my teaching, my preaching, and you act on those words. If you do that, your foundation is solid. If you choose not to do that, you're foolish because you're going to discover if it's anyone else or anything else, it will shift on you. And then you're in a completely different place altogether. Our decision-making responsibilities with small and large decisions that we have to make every day should always fundamentally and first rest on a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do we deal with this? What is God telling me? How should I respond? Where should I go? What should I say? Our decision-making rests on an understanding that Jesus Christ is a part of the process. Now, I know there are times in life when we make simple decisions. What kind of pizza to order? Or what time am I going to go get my oil changed in my car or whatever? I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm talking about decisions that have to do with relationships. I'm talking about decisions that have to do with life that affect other people. We know that on a regular basis, we have to make those kind of decisions, even in the mundane and the routine of life. Where is Jesus in all of that? Do we rely on our own charisma and our own charm and our own intellect, our own good looks? We can pull this off all by ourselves. We all know that we disappoint ourselves because our foundation, if it is built on self, will collapse. It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He is the assurance. He is the hope. He is the foundation. He is the rock. I had a colleague in ministry in another state who had the head football coach of a major, major university in his church. During one particular season, the team was doing terribly bad. They were getting destroyed almost every week. And the coach was receiving death threats, a lot of criticism by the media. Alumni were, of course, very angry and calling for his head. It was time for him to go. So my colleague called him one day and said, hey, listen, man, I know you're going through a lot. The loss last week was terrible. I'm sorry you're having to deal with all of this. And he thought that the coach would say to him, I can't do this anymore. I'm giving up. I'm tired of the criticism. I'm tired of all of it. To hell with everybody. But instead, the coach said, you know, it's all going to be okay. Because I have a faith built on Jesus Christ. And I know because of that, no matter what they say about me, I'm going to heaven. Because Jesus died for me. So it's all going to be okay, no matter what. If they fire me tomorrow, or if we win a national championship, who cares? Now you all, that is a rock-solid foundation. I don't know any of us that appreciate or like criticism. And it's easy sometimes when criticized to say, I quit, I give up, I'm not doing this anymore. But for all of us, fundamentally, we have to ask ourselves, who are we? To whom do we belong? Where do we find strength when we face the storms in life? How do we stand there and deal with the raging winds that are not going to blow us over? Jesus said it is only in a relationship with him, no one and nothing else. So this is basically what it is. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. 
All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Hallelujah. Amen.